All right, so let me paint a picture for you. Stop me if you know this one. You've just gone out and you've picked up the top of the line GoPro that's on the market today. You've brought that shiny new camera home with all of its accessories and you've gone into the settings and you've jacked up every setting you can find to its absolute max. You've boosted the resolution, the frame rates, the bit rates, you've maxed out the lens angle. But then once you've gone out and you've recorded some footage all excited, you come home, you put it into your favorite program, you create a timeline, you edit it, you export it, and you upload it to YouTube, all excited to see that high quality footage. Yet when you go to watch it, well, it just doesn't look right. Maybe it looks a little bit unnatural, maybe it looks a little overly synthetic, maybe honestly it just looks bad, low quality, pixelated, just funny looking. So understandably, you're probably frustrated, you start getting annoyed, maybe you have some buyer's remorse and start thinking, was this $500 GoPro camera really worth it? How do others get such good quality videos on their YouTube channels? Well, let me tell you, I've just spent the last two weeks diving deep into these questions and into this dilemma of what is video quality, crawling down endless rabbit holes online to do my best to get at the heart of it so that you don't have to. So obviously, as the content of this video would suggest, I did recently just go out and purchase one of the brand new GoPro Hero 10 Black cameras to replace my Hero 8 that I've been using to this point. Now, if the only reason that you're here watching this is because you want to just know what settings I've decided on for different scenarios, that's fine. I'll put the timestamp down below so that you can just skip ahead to the actual settings that I use. But if you actually are interested in learning all of the things that I came to discover with regards to image quality and video quality uh, with GoPro cameras, then stick around because I actually learned quite a bit about how to tweak your camera to get that best footage, uh, particularly on platforms like YouTube. So the first thing I'll say, and most of you probably already know this, but there are thousands of videos out there that delve into the minutia of things like resolutions and frame rates and shutter speeds and EV compensations and ND filters and editing tools and all these things. But I imagine, if you're anything like me, you probably just want the highest quality footage you can get with the minimal amount of effort and settings straight out of your camera that you can just import right into whatever editing tool you're using, create your quick videos and upload them to YouTube with as little processing and compression as possible and therefore maintaining that high quality appearance. Uh, you probably don't want to do too much video processing other than you know some typical timeline editing and a few tweaks and, and adjustments here or there. And maybe you don't want to be bothered with hours of professional editing in programs like Adobe Premiere or Final Cut Pro. I mean, heck, many of you guys probably get along just fine using simple programs like iMovie. I use iMovie to make a lot of my videos just because it's simple and it's easy and efficient and fast. Now certainly, if you're a more committed content creator and you do this kind of work for a living, then a lot of what I'm gonna say probably doesn't matter to you because you probably already have the resources, the time, the computing power, the hard drive space, and the editing software to boost everything to the max and have it not be a problem. But again, if you're like me and you just want really good stuff straight out of the camera with as minimal effort as possible, then stick around and let me explain to you what it is that I learned. So the first thing that I learned is that quality is somewhat of a subjective term when it comes to video footage. One person's really high quality may actually look like total garbage to someone else. So to this point, think about how you might define quality. Would you define it as the video footage that's the most crisp or sharp, or maybe has the best colors, or maybe has the most realistic motion blur, or maybe best audio or best stabilization, or maybe just the most lifelike? Maybe to you, the best quality footage is the footage that looks most like something you'd see at a movie theater, AKA cinematic. Uh, maybe it's the footage that has the best lighting or something else that I didn't even mention. So let me start by asking you a question. Have you ever gone into your GoPro settings and boosted things up pretty high? Say you wanna go out and get some really high quality footage, so you set your resolution to 4K, your frame rate to something like 60 FPS, and your bit rate to high. You look at the camera and it says you got two hours worth of space on your SD card. You think, 
eh, I might need a little more space than that. So I'm gonna go in and I'll lower something. I wanna keep it at 4K because I want that resolution. I wanna keep the bit rated high, but I don't plan on doing slow motion, so I'll lower the, the FPS down to 30. That should be more than enough. You come back out though and you look and it still says you have two hours worth of storage on your SD card. You're thinking, what the heck? I lowered the frame rate down to 30. Why is it still the same file size? Well, there's a reason for that. File size is dictated by bit rate. So 4K at 60 FPS and 4K at 30 FPS will actually result in the same file sizes. So here's the thing. Despite what is probably your first intuition that 60 FPS is better and therefore higher quality than 30 FPS just because it's higher, the 30 FPS footage will actually look better in the end because the data is spread out over fewer frames, meaning each single frame actually contains more of the data and lower FPS therefore means less compression is happening on each frame. Similarly, an FPS set to even lower at 24 will have even more data per frame, but 24 can also come at the cost of potentially looking a little more jittery than 30. Of course, this discussion is all somewhat moot if you're the kind of person that typically likes to slow down your footage for slow motion shots or if you plan to. Obviously, you need to record higher than 30 FPS if you plan to do slow-mo, but if you don't, 30 FPS or even 24 is going to give you the highest quality footage per frame for your video. So now that we're on the topic of bitrate, just like with previous models of the GoPro, the Hero 10 has two settings for bitrate, standard and high. Now, almost any video you watch online, they're gonna tell you to always set your bitrate to high to get the maximum quality videos that you can get. And to some extent, that is correct. However, Using high setting does come with one big drawback, and that is that your file sizes will be huge, almost twice as big as the standard setting. This not only means that you need more storage, but it makes for much larger project files in your editing software and also longer export times to create your final videos, and also can lead to your camera getting too hot, which is a common problem with the GoPro 10. Now for most resolution and frame rate combinations on the Hero 10, standard bitrate is set to 60 megabits per second and high 100 megabits per second. And just for reference for what those numbers mean, bitrate for standard broadcast HD television is like eight. So even at the lower GoPro resolutions like 1080p, the standard bitrate is still 45 megabits per second, which is over five times greater than standard broadcast television. There is actually a really handy chart published on the GoPro website that identifies all the bit rates if you're interested. Now bit rate also comes into play when talking about what software you use to create and export your videos, but also what your ultimate intended use is for your videos. So if all you plan to do is upload your videos to YouTube, it doesn't matter if you record in 4K resolution with a high frame rate and at 100 megabits per second bit rate, YouTube will only support up to 85 megabits per second for your file. What's more is if you're recording at a standard frame rate, like 30 frames per second, YouTube only supports up to 56 megabits per second, which is less than the standard setting on your camera to begin with. So what I'm trying to say here is that if you plan to only upload to YouTube and watch your files maybe on your own personal computer or even on an HD TV at your house or on some kind of display at home, there's no real reason that you need to use the high bit rates. It only makes for humongous files and very long export times. If you simply want the highest quality files that you can possibly get and don't care about disk space or processing time or project files, and you don't mind the fact that YouTube is still going to downsample your file anyway, then by all means, use the highest bit rate. I mean, I suppose there's an argument to be made that you might as well give YouTube the highest quality file that you can and just let them sort it out. There's that word quality again. So it's important to note too that yes, technology does change quickly. So in one sense, you could make the argument that you might as well record at the highest possible bit rate you can 
to essentially extend the shelf life of your videos. I mean, have you ever gone back and tried to watch a video on YouTube from 2008 that's at 240p? Yeah, it looks pretty bad. At any rate, pun intended, this brings up another important point, and that is what software you use to create and export your files. If you are using a professional program like Adobe Premiere or Final Cut Pro, then yes, you have a lot more flexibility in setting the parameters of your video timeline, uh, as well as the specific export settings. But if you are relying on simpler programs like iMovie, you should also know that there are limitations introduced by the software. For example, iMovie for Mac OS does not currently support exporting at 4K resolution in 60 frames per second. It supports 4K at 30 frames per second, and it supports lower resolutions like 1080p at 60 frames per second. But right now, if you are recording on your GoPro in 4K 60 frames per second, and you're using iMovies to create your videos, you cannot export 60 FPS at 4K iMovie will compress your file down to 30 frames per second anyway, so you might as well record at 30 frames per second if you want to use 4K. Now, if you're recording at 1080p, then go nuts by all means, but if you're recording at 4K, you might as well set it to 30 or 24 FPS if you're using iMovie. Now, if you are using iMovie, when you go to export your file, there's also an option to select quality. For point of reference here, the high setting is 50 megabits per second which incidentally is what YouTube recommends for 4K 30 uploads. But if you actually want to maintain, say, 60 megabits per second that you may have recorded uh, using the GoPro standard settings, say, then you need to actually select the custom option and move the slider to 60. Now you may notice too that the slider only goes up to 66.67. This means that even if you recorded at the highest bitrate setting, 100 megabits per second on your GoPro, if you're using iMovie to export your video for YouTube, the highest export setting you can achieve is 66.67 anyway. So all you've done is waste time and hard drive space. Now again, if you're using more robust software like Final Cut Pro or Adobe Premiere, you can export at higher bit rates like 100 megabits per second, but remember, YouTube will still compress it down to 85 megabits per second anyway. So again, the only reason to export a project file at a high bit rate, like 100 megabits per second, in advanced editing software is so that you have that file with the highest possible quality for your own archive, or for one day when YouTube does support those bit rates, you could re-upload your file. And maybe if you wanna watch it on some really kick-ass home entertainment system or display, that bit rate might be better. Again, if you're just recording 4K 30 and you're using iMovie to upload your files, you might as well record at the standard bit rate setting because that's about all you're gonna get anyway on YouTube's platform. So speaking of YouTube, there's actually a really important thing that's worth mentioning regarding uploads, and that is the codec that YouTube uses to both code and decode your file. Now, without getting into the jargon, there are essentially two codecs that YouTube uses to process your file, one being far superior to the other. Now, the best way for you to ensure that your videos get processed using that higher codec is essentially just to upload a video in 4K. If you upload a 1080p video, it's going to use the lower quality codec. So if you upload it 4K or higher, you will ensure that YouTube processes your file when it processes the high definition versions of your file using the higher codec, which is known as the VP9 codec. Otherwise, it's going to use the lower quality codec, which is the AV1 codec. Now you can check which codec is being used by YouTube to code and decode your file by right-clicking on the video during playback and selecting Stats for Nerds, and then under the codec's heading, the first few letters indicate which codec is being used. You can see here on one of my 1080p videos uh, that YouTube has used the AV1 codec, which makes sense, whereas on this video here, which I'm playing at high resolution, you can see the VP9 codec was used. There's another important thing to consider, and that is the issue that some settings on your camera itself purposely throw away pixels, crop the image, or resample the files. Using things like HyperSmooth Boost, 
crops a significant portion of the recorded image, as does horizon leveling, which incidentally I'm using right now on the tripod. Similarly, using an aspect ratio of 16 by 9, while it is compatible with platforms like YouTube, isn't actually using the entire lens of the camera like a 4 by 3 ratio does. Another thing to note is the super view option on your GoPro does in fact use the entire lens of the camera, but then effectively smushes down the image in order to fit into a 16 by 9 aspect ratio, which means the image is not actually raw anymore, but has been processed to some degree. Never mind the ridiculous amount of warping edge effects you get on super view. Now, if you're out there on a motorcycle or a mountain bike and you want to get that super wide view, then sure, use super view. But just know that there's some internal processing going on in your camera in order to create that image. So lastly comes the topic of quality as it relates to realism. And what I mean is that our own eyeballs really only see somewhere between 30 and 60 frames per second, at least for most of us. This is why when you look out your car window as you're driving down the road, things look blurry because your eyes are not able to process that quickly. Similarly, just shaking your hand in front of your face looks blurry, yet on the camera it probably doesn't because the camera is working in such a way that it's not getting those blur effects, which is what leads to a lot of videos looking overly synthetic or not natural or not real enough. So if you're recording at particularly high frame rates, the videos can really look unnatural or synthetic because there is none of that apparent blur that our eyes are used to. Uh, instead, it kind of looks like a progression of sort of very stuttered but yet in focus images. Uh, and the honest truth is that our brains like some blur. It's also important to note that in Hollywood, films are made at 24 frames per second. So our brains have also just gotten used to that type of presentation on the screen. So this is what people often mean when they talk about a video having a cinematic feel to it. It typically means a lower frame rate, like the Hollywood frame rate of 24 frames per second, or incorporating some small level of motion blur into the footage so that it just has that more realistic look to it and what our brains are honestly just more used to. Now personally, I actually prefer 30 frames per second over 24 just because I think 24 has a little bit too much jitter for GoPro footage, but this is often why you hear so many YouTubers speak praises of 24 frames per second. All right, so with regards to trying to incorporate some level of realistic motion blur into your footage, it's actually really hard to do this using standard GoPro settings. You see, motion blur comes from longer shutter speeds, so the best way to get that effect is to essentially slow down your shutter speed on your camera. But when you do this, it also means you're allowing more light into the camera and thereby washing out all your images. So this is why when you research this topic, most people will tell you the best way to get this effect is to incorporate what are called neutral density filters over your lens. And these are basically just sunglasses for your camera. All right, so just to recap, if you want to incorporate some level of realistic motion blur into your footage, you need to set a shutter speed that's slower than what GoPro wants to use, but then also add some kind of ND filter to the front of your lens to offset the additional light that will then be coming into the sensor. So it's a two-part problem. You gotta slow down the shutter speed, but also incorporate sunglasses over your lens. But there's a catch to this. Doing this can also result in the hypersmooth function not working as well on your camera, especially if you're using the higher hypersmooth settings. And this is because hypersmooth works by comparing adjacent frames in your footage, and if the frames are blurry, it has a harder time lining them up. Right, so what does all this mean? Well, it means that the best approach I've found is to just to try and incorporate a small amount of blur using the appropriate ND filter for that setting, and then also keeping the hypersmooth setting at a more modest or low setting. Using that sort of combination of modest settings will give you a little bit of blur to make it more realistic, but still allow the hyper smooth function to keep your image stabilized. Now, a typical rule of thumb for filmmaking is that whatever FPS setting you're using, to use a shutter speed that is one over two times your FPS. For example, if you're using 30 frames per second, you want to use a shutter speed that's one over 60. 
you're using 24 frames per second, then you wanna use a shutter speed of one over 48. Now this does create the nice and very realistic blur that you're used to in Hollywood, but it does not play well with the hyper smooth, which there are many videos that talk about this problem. So instead, what I found is that if you use a shutter speed that is one over four times your FPS setting or even higher, will still give you some level of perceptible blur, but also still allow the hyper smooth setting to function properly. I suppose it's also worth adding a word about video post-production, or as all the cool kids like to say in their videos, post. I like to grade my videos in post. I add stabilization in post. Sometimes I incorporate lens correction. But seriously though, what I'm trying to say here is that if you are a more fully committed content creator with a more advanced portfolio of video production and editing skills, then yeah, you are likely going to make absolutely the highest quality videos possible, incorporating every bell and whistle and tweak imaginable to get the perfect cinema quality footage. But as I've said so many times before, for folks like me that keep this channel afloat purely as a hobby outside of my full-time job, I don't really have the kind of time necessary for this sort of production quality. Now that's not to say I don't use Final Cut Pro from time to time, I do, but definitely not to the extent that others are using it. What I'm getting at here is that GoPros are designed to create very high quality videos straight from the camera. I mean, that's why they're so attractive as action cameras. So if you are also looking to have a workflow that is as time efficient as possible, then many of the settings on your camera will likely be best kept just at their default settings. Are these the absolute best settings you can use? No, typically not. But for the amount of time it would take to maybe get that extra five or 10% boost in production value, it would require an order of magnitude more as far as my time commitment. So with all this said, what does this all mean for me, for my settings, and possibly for you? For a typical GoPro user looking to create the best quality footage straight from the camera using simple video production and editing software for an end product that will look great on YouTube, here's what I recommend. First, stick with the standard bitrate, especially if you're recording at 4K 30. 60 megabits is more than enough to get high quality footage. Now again, if you want the best quality footage for your home archive or for shelf life, then sure, boost it up to 100, but just know that YouTube's gonna downsample it anyway. Second, stick with 4K resolution. Yes, the new GoPros come with 5.3K, and if you really wanna record at that so you have the highest resolution footage for your home archive, that's fine. But for the purposes of YouTube, 4K is more than enough, especially considering that most people watch YouTube videos at 1080p anyway but uploading at 4K will at least allow YouTube to use that better codec and it will give you high definition footage should you want to watch it. Third, use a low frame rate. Despite what your intuition might be telling you, sticking with 30 or even 24 frames per second will give you better quality footage per frame since that bitrate data is being spread out over a fewer number of frames. Now, of course, if you need slow motion or you plan to do slow-mo shots, then yes, you're gonna have to bump up to 60 frames per second. Four, use a wide field of view, especially if you're out there doing action or point of view shots. Set your camera angle to wide or even super view, even though yes, it does come with some compression, which actually leads to number five, which is to use the entire sensor. So if you can go in there and set your camera to use 4K at four by three resolution instead of 16 by nine, you're actually getting a larger image per frame. Now, if you wanna record in 16 by nine, that's perfectly fine. It's still a great image, it's still high quality, and it's optimized for YouTube. But if you set it to super view, what the camera's actually doing is taking that four by three shot and smooshing it down. So you're getting more in the picture but at the cost of some sort of compression and smushing effects. And lastly, number six, don't use overly excessive processing that's gonna throw away pixels, overly crop or resample files, but some is okay. So in other words, if you're using 4K, 30 frames per second, use either the four by three wide, like I was saying, or 16 by nine wide, 
or maybe Superview, but keep hyper smooth to regular. Don't use the boost if you really don't need it because it's just going to crop your image even further. All right, so let's wrap this up. Now, before I end this video, there are just a few other small points that I think are worth mentioning. The first is that the GoPro 10 actually has a couple of new features that are worth mentioning when compared to previous models. First is a new feature called 3D noise reduction. This is meant to help the camera process footage in low light conditions. Now, incidentally, 3D NR only works in 4K 30 or 24 or 1080 60. So if you know you're gonna be in low light conditions, remember to use one of those settings. Now the second quick point that I wanna mention, and rather apropos considering my camera literally just shut down moments ago for overheating, is that there are two new modes for the GoPro 10 that were introduced with the most recent firmware upgrade. One of these modes is meant to extend the battery life a little bit, and one of the modes is meant to prevent overheating when using your camera, say on a tripod. So overheating occurs, as you can imagine, when the camera's just kind of sitting there, but you've got it cranked up to some pretty high settings and that processor's chugging away, generating all that heat and there's no airflow going over the camera and the camera shuts itself down. So when you set it into one of these other modes, what the camera does is it turns off certain features that it knows you're not gonna need, like GPS or hyper smooth. But to extend the battery life, and to also help preventing the overheating, what these modes do is they lower the bit rates for your camera. For example, the 4K30 combination that I'm actually using right now will only record at 45 megabits per second in standard bit rate when in either extended battery or tripod mode. Knowing that I wanted to keep this video at 60 megabits per second, I kept it in maximum performance mode, which then ultimately led to the overheating. So needless to say, the GoPro 10 is still working out some issues with overheating. One other thing that's worth noting is that along with the firmware upgrade, GoPro did also introduce uh, a new type of battery called the Enduro battery, which is supposed to help also offset both of these problems, operate at cooler temperatures, but also operate for longer periods of time. So I'm actually using one of these batteries in the camera right now, and it does seem to be performing much more efficiently. <sighs> well, that is it. That is all I got. I really hope that you guys found this video useful, especially those of you out there watching that are just like me, where you just want really high quality footage straight off the camera into a simple timeline, simple editing, simple post-production, easy exports, with an end result of a high definition video on YouTube that you can watch and be happy with. So I know I didn't get into all of my specific presets and, and protein settings. So what I'll do here at the very end is I'll just show you the settings that I use for each of my different scenarios. So if that's all you want out of this video, then I'm happy to share. So again, thank you. I hope this video was useful. Take care, be safe, have fun out there, and I'll see you in the next video.